tonight. Where we are now, it's got to be considered a more dangerous place than we've ever been in before. Everyone should be treated with dignity and fairness and decency. How small is Trump? You don't always get, like, a date. I haven't had a date for the past two years. Irish citizens are flying home from around the world to vote on a referendum tomorrow that could overturn one of the strictest abortion bans anywhere. Ireland's Eighth Amendment prohibits abortion in almost all cases. Italy's new prime minister is a law professor with no political experience. Giuseppe Conte will lead the country's first populist government, an alliance between the anti-establishment Five Star Movement and the far-right League that's promised billions in tax cuts and increases to welfare spending. Eight women have accused Morgan Freeman of inappropriate behavior and sexual harassment, according to a CNN report. Freeman said today he apologizes to anyone who felt uncomfortable or disrespected. And Harvey Weinstein is expected to turn himself into law enforcement on Friday to face sexual misconduct charges from one of his accusers. President Trump's 2020 campaign has already raised more than $40 million before any major Democratic candidate has even raised a dime. Trump also got a head start, given that he filed his re-election paperwork the week he was inaugurated. Airmen who provide security at a nuclear missile base in Wyoming got caught dropping acid on their days off, according to documents from 2016 obtained by the AP. It's a good reminder that while nuclear weapons are incredibly deadly, guarding them in the middle of nowhere is incredibly boring. The president said he canceled the big summit with North Korea today because Kim was being rude. But if it was really about insults, this whole thing would have fallen apart long before now. This maniac. Fire and fury. Rocket man is on a suicide mission. That ongoing food fight was actually starting to feel normal until the summit breakthrough. Then the detente started to feel normal until today's switcheroo. But the announcement wasn't totally out of the blue. Just a couple days ago, Trump warned the June 12th date might not hold. We will see. But still, it was a pretty jarring turn of events. This morning we woke up to news that North Korea had blown up its nuclear testing facilities. Just a few hours later, the letter of the White House said Trump dictated himself the summit was canceled. Or maybe it wasn't. It's possible that the existing summit could take place or a summit at some later date. Nobody should be anxious. We have to get it right. There's a lot to be puzzled about in terms of strategy and process. South Korean officials have been deeply involved, but they said they were blindsided by today's news. One emerging explanation for what's going on here is that the foundation for these high-level talks just wasn't coming together. In a hearing this morning, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the only American to actually meet with Kim so far, said the U.S. was prepared, but that North Korea wasn't. Over the past many days, uh, we have endeavored to do what Chairman Kim and I had agreed, was to put teams, preparation teams together to begin to work to prepare for the summit. And we had received no response to our inquiries from them. So now what? Are things back to square one? Or is it just another part of a diplomatic dance? I spoke to Ambassador Robert Gallucci, who served as chief U.S. negotiator with North Korea back during the 1994 nuclear crisis. Anybody who has watched diplomacy at all noted that this thing was upside down or carpet for the horse or, or whatever, that you don't start with a summit and, and then you have detailed negotiations to work out uh, how actually things are going to work in the engineering of a deal. Uh, that where the physics is done by the leadership. That's, we, I don't know of any other case where that was the proposed course. And all of us said, well, this is unusual. This letter today the president sent to North Korea, how do you characterize that letter? Do you feel like it's a negotiation tactic by the president? First of all, reading the letter, um, I had the fear that he actually wrote it, which is to say that the syntax, the 
the way it's framed, uh, including the threat about nuclear weapons, but also the possibility of reversing everything, he said in the upper paragraphs, in a heartbeat, if you'd like to, uh, which is a, a, a standard, uh, apparently, that the president has of saying, well, we'll, you know, we'll go and it'll work or it won't work. I don't know. Let's wait and see. There's a reason why I think diplomats talk the way they do when they're dealing with things other than fishing rights. When you're dealing with the nuclear weapons programs and that, I think you really work at moderation. That doesn't mean that if the other side raises the temperature, you don't go up with it to demonstrate you're prepared to. I understand that. But that's not where you want to be. We have never had a president who talked so easily about the use of nuclear weapons. It makes some of us wonder whether he's really looked at the magnitude of destruction. Overall, do you feel like that we've turned a corner with North Korea? I mean, that people were afraid of actual armed conflict. Do you think that the fact of seeing this summit fall apart, does that put that back on the table or is that just old news now? The bad news today, um, unambiguous bad news, is that the summit being off means that we will not find out whether the nuclear crisis over North Korea's capability to strike the United States with ICBMs armed with thermonuclear weapons can be ended. That's the bad news. Today, President Trump awarded the Medal of Honor to former Navy SEAL Brit Slabinski for his bravery in the Battle of Roberts Ridge in Afghanistan in 2002. While leading a rescue mission to save a fellow SEAL who'd fallen from a helicopter, Slabinski and his team came under heavy fire from Taliban fighters. He ordered an evacuation and led his men to safety during a 14-hour fight. But the story of what happened that day may be more complicated than the medal citation makes it sound. The Air Force has recommended another member of Slabinski's team for a Medal of Honor, Air Force Technical Sergeant John Chapman. Chapman was wounded just minutes into the battle and was left behind when Slabinski, thinking Chapman was dead, ordered the SEAL team to evacuate. But in 2016, the Air Force collected video evidence that showed Chapman wasn't dead and that he fought off Taliban fighters alone for an hour until he was fatally shot in the chest. Sama Steli, a friend of Chapman and a fellow Air Force veteran, wasn't there that day, but he studied footage and other evidence of what happened. All the evidence shows that Chapman became conscious and he commenced to wreaking havoc on all the Taliban that were in his immediate area. About an hour and a half longer, uh, Chinook comes in when the Taliban starts shooting at the helicopter. He knew that was his backup. So he stands up, he crawls out of the hole and goes to engage him, and that's when they get him in the chest. That sounds like Medal of Honor worthy heroism. But according to allegations first reported in Newsweek, Navy and Special Operations Command Brass tried to prevent Chapman from getting his medal because accepting the Air Force's version of events would mean Slabinski violated, even if unintentionally, a cardinal rule, never leave a teammate behind. Nobody is condemning Slabinski for making that decision. It's very hurtful that anyone would ever try and block Chappie's accommodation because if Chappie don't deserve a Medal of Honor, nobody deserves one. Doug Sterner, a veteran and expert on military awards, says this level of infighting is pretty much unprecedented in the history of the Medal of Honor. I've never seen anything like this inter-service rivalry. Now, it's uh, hung a pall over the awards that I wish did not exist. I believe that Brit Slabinski on that hillside did his job the best way that he could. And if mistakes were made, those mistakes take nothing away from the heroism that he demonstrated. Slabinski himself maintains that, while he believed Chapman to be dead, it would have been in Chapman's character to continue fighting. And he said in the past that Chapman deserves the highest honors. And while Chapman is expected to receive a posthumous Medal of Honor at some point, it's still not clear if he'll be recognized for what he did after Slabinski left him for dead. This is Informed Choices, one of thousands of pro-life crisis pregnancy centers, or CPCs, in the country. They provide free health services to pregnant women, but they don't offer abortion. This is the first time they've allowed cameras inside their facility. 
If you turn this way, I wanted to point out our promise. So this is something that our patients receive. We're going to treat you with respect. We will not pressure you. We will support you and we will not lie to you. You know, the we will not lie to you bit, like why did that come about? Tell me about that. You know, because I think there's a very um, untrue narrative that says, oh, don't go to a center like that because they're going to lie to you. I can absolutely say that's not who we are. We exist to help women imagine the possibilities of life. Let's now go into our examination okay. room. So Truly. if a woman comes in and she she's pregnant and she decides that she wants to terminate that pregnancy, what happens in that moment in informed choices? I mean, one thing we're, we're absolutely clear about is that every woman has three choices. And every woman can choose to end her pregnancy, to parent, or to place her child for adoption. Those are the rights that we have in America. But the state of California says CPCs frequently mislead women about what services they provide. That's why the state passed the 2015 FACT Act, requiring licensed CPCs like Informed Choices to post signs that tell women they can get access to low-cost or free health services from the state, including abortion. But CPCs don't think they should be forced to post those signs and have challenged the law in the Supreme Court, which is set to rule on the case any day now. I think for a lot of people, the idea of you putting up a sign that just says, hey, we don't provide abortions here, but if you do want to look for that, the state of California can offer you some other options. What is the fundamental problem you have with the idea of putting a sign up that, that Well, my that? fundamental problem really has nothing to do with abortion. It has to do with free speech. Essentially, we are being required to use the walls of our pregnancy clinic as advertising for the abortion industry. And I have a real problem with that. But when I Googled abortion Gilroy, California, um, Planned Parenthood came up as number one. But Informed Choices came up as number two. But you guys don't provide abortion. No, but we provide abortion information. But w one of the things that I think that your detractors say is that women who might be actually seeking an abortion service think that they can go to yeah. this kind of facility to actually receive an abortion. And the way we mitigate that is to be very clear on our website as well as on the information in our reception area. It says very clearly that we do not refer or perform abortion. But Assemblyman David Chu, who wrote the FACT Act based in part on a report from an abortion rights advocacy group, wants CPCs to do more. A crisis pregnancy center is a fake health center that purports to provide pregnant women who are in need of information services that assist them when they're pregnant. Um, but in reality, uh, they're run by extreme activists who are providing lies and misinformation. They will tell you that if you consider an abortion, you'll get breast cancer, um, you will become severely depressed, uh, you'll never be able to have children again, you may become suicidal. Why not just take away that? licenses? I mean, if they are perpetuating this kind of fraud or giving medical misinformation, why does the state of California continue to provide them with medical licenses? Uh, well, these clinics do provide some services, but uh, our law is very simple. It simply says you need to provide a one or two line notice to someone who's walking in the door about whether a facility is licensed or if it is licensed, what kind of services are available in California. That's it. Now it's up to the Supreme Court to decide if that's legal. There is precedent for the California law. In some states, the government already compels speech about abortion. Three states require doctors to describe ultrasound images to women before they can get an abortion. Others demand a discussion about adoption before a woman can end her pregnancy. It was a point Justice Breyer brought up at the Supreme Court oral arguments back in March. If a pro-life state can tell a doctor you have to tell people about adoption, why can't a pro-choice state tell a doctor, a, a facility of whatever it is, you have to tell people about abortion? Despite Justice Breyer's comments, court watchers think there's a good chance the justices will rule in favour of CPCs, so they won't have to post signs about abortion services. But ironically, if the CPC side does win the fight in California, they could end up losing those anti-abortion gains they've made in other states. 
So are you hoping in a way that your law gets struck down? It's been pointed out that we might be winning either way. If the California law gets struck down, it opens up the door for constitutional challenges for all of those laws in all of those other states. So, you've probably been getting a lot of these emails lately. Why? Because of GDPR, a new European data law that goes into effect May 25th. The law covers EU citizens, but could have broader implications. GDPR was designed to give, quote, data subjects, more commonly known as people, new rights and greater control over their personal data. For instance, you will now have the right to move your data to a different social network or have your personal information completely erased. Companies will also be required to notify users within 72 hours of a data breach, and rule breakers will face steep fines. If you're a fan of transparency, all of this is good news. But there's one part of the GDPR that tech companies will fight tooth and nail, a section that's been referred to as the right to explanation. Basically, it would require companies to tell users what data was used and how it was computed by an algorithm. The GDPR specifically mentions automated decisions on job applications and credit applications. But in theory, it could apply to any algorithm that has a, quote, significant effect on a user's life, like a Facebook ad, for example. You would need to make an argument that this ad is affecting you in a significant way. So, for example, if job ads are being shown to you, this could actually be affecting your life. Just what constitutes a significant effect will play out in EU courts. That means Google or Facebook might have to unveil how certain algorithms that they base their businesses on work. These algorithms have enabled tech companies to make billions of dollars. That's why tech companies have always refused to disclose their inner workings, which they consider trade secrets. But with GDPR, they might not have a choice. West Hollywood is exactly the place you'd expect to proclaim a day to be Stormy Daniels Day and hand over a shiny key to the city in front of Chi Chi LaRue's adult boutique. The community of West Hollywood was founded more than three decades ago on the principle that everyone should be treated with dignity and fairness and decency. How small is Trump? Everywhere you look, there are signs of the city's resistance to President Donald Trump. I hereby declare it Stormy Daniels Day in the city of West Hollywood. So we've been fighting this fight, and along came this unlikely heroine, you know, in the profile Wait, of Wait, heroine? I consider her a heroine. We're not giving her an award for being a porn star. I've never seen her movies. I'm a gay man. Never seen her movies, so I don't really know. We're giving her this presentation because she's taken on the Trump administration. We have somebody helping us in the fight. So Wednesday, Stormy Daniels, porn star, porn director, self-proclaimed adulterer, and plaintiff was the queen of the resistance. You just don't think it's a little ridiculous to give her the key to the city? No, I think it's amazing. Because I think what other city in the United States would that happen? For some people, she is the perfect counterpoint to the president. I don't judge her for what she's done in her work or on camera or anything. I judge her for standing up to, I believe, the biggest bully in the world. This mini-coronation of Daniels means America is a different place than, say, the late 90s, when another woman who messed around with a president became not only a punchline, but a pariah. Why do you think we live in a world where Stormy Daniels, porn star but also adulterer, Mm -hmm. um, is being upheld, and Monica Lewinsky back then was basically run out of town? I think if Monica did what she did back then, but now, it would be a really different story. And I think that, you know, she would probably end up being part of the Me Too movement because she'd be like, hey, I was an intern and this dude did a shitty thing to me. Trump hasn't only altered the political game, whether he meant to or not. He's helped push this country in a direction where women with famous first names aren't just the punchline. They can make money off their stories, sell t-shirts, and smile as they own their little corner of history. I never thought I would have a prom. I never thought I would get to really experience that. 
We don't dance normally, most of us. We all look ridiculous. Go find somebody. If you find me, come dance with me. I will love you. <laughs> We are looking at pictures from past proms. This is, you know, that classic dad's gonna kill the date picture. This is one of the ones we printed out to enter me for Miss Photogenic of Huntsville. I actually won Miss Photogenic of Huntsville, but then I won a national title for Best Smile. Sydney would get in trouble at school a lot because she's very social and she would just get up and walk around the classroom. And once we pulled her out of school and she had nobody to talk to, <laughs> For a little while, we found out she's really smart. <laughs> the biggest challenge with homeschooling is that I am a very social person. So the only social that I get is through extracurricular activities. Dance, musical theater, Boy Scouts, it's a venturing program that is co-ed or actually prom. This year's theme was Whispers of the Sea, which was a nautical, theme punk, underwater uh, experience. I am the president of Timeless Homeschool Events, and Huntsville Homeschool Prom is one of our events that we put on yearly. Like, like you are love in action for being here and giving your time. The first thing that we're gonna ask you guys to do is to sign our core value sheet. We're saying regardless of any child's orientation, gender, their color, that we love them as they are. We take prom very seriously. <laughs> A lot of homeschoolers, they don't have the opportunity to have dances. This is so these kids could be here smiling, laughing, and they will just have a fabulous time. I'm excited that it's my senior prom, and I'm, I'm very excited to go with my boyfriend at the moment. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> They've been dating for a few months now, and I love Matthew. He's a great kid. He's very extra person. <laughs> you know those theater kids? Yeah, he is one. Yeah. We're not really going anywhere nice for dinner. We're really just going to Chick-fil-A. We really wanted to get prom pictures with the cow. Then after that, we're gonna go to prom. We have people all the way from Mississippi, Georgia, Florida will come to this prom. We'll have a lot of fun. <laughs> Seniors to the dance floor with your date. Time to dance. I realized I didn't have a date, and so I messaged Preston on Snapchat and said, Hey, will you go to prom with me? And he said, Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Best buds. I asked him to prom. She thought she was clever with a prom sign. Yeah, I made a prom proposal, and it said, oh, so he's gonna be a Marine, and I said, before you report for duty, come to prom and shake your booty, because I thought I was so funny. You don't always get, like, a date. I haven't had a date for the past two years, and it's a different experience each time, so you have to take it by, fly by the seat of your pants. You can be left out of your friends sometimes, it just kind of happens you know, where you're on your own for a while. But it still turned out great, a great experience, and I enjoyed every moment of it. When I met her, she was very kind to me. She did my hair for a show that we did. She made jokes with me. She made me feel comfortable around her. So when she joined a show that I told her, hey, auditions are tomorrow, and she showed up to the first rehearsal late, but she still looked awesome in her, in her Boy Scout uniform. I thought to myself, I might want to try. It was surreal to me that a girl so pretty, national best smile, so kind, would say yes to someone like me. I took a shower that night and I was just, just water fell on my face. I never know why I said yes. I just kind of said, yeah, sure. And then <laughs> we, we started dating, but yeah, I didn't really, I don't know. I don't know, it didn't really impact me as much because I had had one boyfriend before. 
Would you stop? <laughs> Both of my daughters that have attended the prom, they've had heartache and tragedy in their little lives because of it, but they've also had wonderful, magical moments. And that's life. It's what makes us human. If we can't experience those highs and lows and cope with them and still turn out to be high-functioning people, then, <laughs> then there's not a lot of hope for the human race. <laughs> After high school, I'm gonna be attending Troy University joining the Marines. Currently, I'm working on getting my GED. Um, and after that, I, so I just plan on joining the workforce and going that route. I'm going to Calhoun Community College just to figure out what I want to do and do some, get some basic classes out of the way.